Good morning and welcome into God's house this morning. We ask the Lord's rich blessing upon you as you worship with us today. Uh, just a few announcements to draw your attention to um, this morning. First of all, next Sunday, the clocks go back one hour, so extra sleep, I guess. Um, but make sure you do that, otherwise you're going to be a, an hour early, which is fine. The church will be open, so you can get in. <laughs> um, also, a reminder that my uh, Sunday school class uh, will be on Zoom. Uh, the link is there for uh, the Bible study. It's the same link uh, that we have for that. So that'll be at 2 o'clock. Um, and also, we do want to uh, remember Daniel in our prayers. He was in hospital this past week, and uh, he was diagnosed with uh, stomach cancer. And he is, he is home, but, uh, but they're not going to be treating him uh, with chemones. So we do want to remember him uh, in our prayers. Also, Sharon uh, Savage, Ron Burr's uh, sister that we've been praying for a number of uh, months now, uh, she'd had a treatment, um, and now, unfortunately, it's come back on the another side of the brain, and so they're going to do the procedure on that side too. And so we do pray that that would... Uh, that would go well. And also, uh, we were able to make an appointment to see um, Hermaine in, in uh, prison, and uh, so Sheena will be uh, visiting with her next Sunday, and we hope that that visit goes well also. Well, let us enter into God's presence with the singing of his praises as we sing from the Blue Hymnals number 89. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. 
They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. People of God, let's worship the Lord with joyful hearts. For our strength and help is in the name of the Lord, and he is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Amen. Let's worship God further in song as we celebrate today Reformation uh, number 443. As I call to holiness, I'd like to read from a letter to Titus, chapter one, uh, 2, verses 1 to 15. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, <clears throat> that they be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the younger women, young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned. The one who is, in, is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, not showing, but showing good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing 
of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. And now let's come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We're thankful again that you receive us as your children. And Lord, that you remind us of how it is that we are to walk before you. How it is that we are to be the light of the world. The salt of the world. And our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that guides us in that path of righteousness upon which you have placed us through the working of your Holy Spirit and through the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, though the world rejects your word and though they live lives uh, that are wicked and ungodly, nevertheless, the gospel shines through your people and delivers a powerful message to them that they uh, stand opposed to you and that their lives are opposite of what you require in your law and display in your people. And so, Father, we pray that you would indeed use us as instruments of righteousness, as instruments that challenge those that are ungodly, not to condemn, but to call them to repentance and faith, to display to them how sinners can be transformed through the working of your Holy Spirit, through the gospel, into saints. And our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed bless each and every one of your children, that we would not uh, think lowly of ourselves, that somehow we can't make a difference, uh, but rather, our Father, we pray that we might Go forth uh, embracing your word and embracing that faith of our fathers. And Lord, that we might live according to it. For our Father, we certainly don't want what your passage says, that when we don't live that way, we cause your name to be blasphemed. And that, that is not what we desire, but rather we uh, would like to see uh, every knee bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and by believing in him that they would have eternal life. And so Father we pray that you would indeed fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and lead us and guide us into holiness this week for we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and respond as we sing from the Blue Hymnals number 112. Then 
shall my soul be satisfied. My mouth shall praise, proclaim. My mouth shall praise, proclaim. Thy lips shall in thy praise delight when on my bed I rest at night and meditate. Because thy hand assistance brings beneath the shadow of thy wings, my heart shall joyful be, my heart shall joyful be. God encourages us in our holiness by reminding us that if we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You may be seated. The morning offering will now be received, and it will be for the general fund. And now let's come before God with our morning prayers. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful to be in your presence because you cause our hearts to be at peace, to be at rest, to be filled with hope and comfort. And our Father in heaven, it is only you, when you speak to us, uh, that we truly enter into the rest that the Lord Jesus Christ died to secure. And our Father in heaven, this is a day that you have set aside so that we, from the busyness of life, may indeed be reminded and rejoice in all that you have accomplished for us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, we know that no news, no set of circumstances, no future uh, events that loom ahead of us can in any way diminish that which you grant to each and every one of your children. And our Father in heaven, as we've heard this morning already, uh, that one of your saints, Daniel, uh, has received sad news that he has cancer in the stomach. Uh, But our Father in heaven, we are thankful for his strong faith in you and that he can still smile And our Father in heaven, that is a testimony of your grace in his life. And our Father, even as your word says, 
even death, cannot take away the comfort of the gospel that each and every one of us has that believes in your name. And so, Father, we pray that you would indeed pour out a rich measure of your blessing upon him this morning, uh, even though he tried to be here but was not able. But our Father in heaven, we pray that we may indeed see him back in due time. And Lord, that we might indeed uh, share wonderful fellowship with him as we have done for a number of years. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would be with his uh, daughter and son and the rest of the family. And Lord, that you would uh, comfort them and strengthen them uh, with the sure knowledge that you have him and all of your children in the palm of your hands. Our Father in heaven, we pray also that you would uh, be with Sharon uh, Savage. And Lord, uh, we were uh, thankful for the surgery that she was able to have and that the cancer has not returned in those places, um, but has in an, another part of the brain. And so, our Father, we pray that the same uh, treatment will be effective uh, for that too. Uh, but our Father now we know what disappointment there is when we think that uh, we've gotten uh, over it and then it returns again. And so we pray that you would indeed surround her and her family uh, with your strength and comfort and grant them hope uh, as they await uh, the treatment once again. Our Father in heaven, indeed, we pray for all of our saints, elderly saints, and Lord, we know that uh, long life is a blessing, but it can also bring struggles. And so, our Father, we commend each and every one to you. We pray that you would be with Mary Scott and uh, surround her with your love and grace this morning and also with Bob Santo. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, keep them in the palm of your hands and uh, all others in our congregation. As Bob Marginal, we're thankful that we were um, that he's here this morning and we just pray that you would continue to cause him to uh, be stronger and, and stronger each week. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would indeed uh, be with those that face other challenges in their, in their health and Lord, we continue to remember Danielle and we continue to remember Ruth Dieleman and Lord, we pray that you would indeed sustain uh, your children and uh, their families. And Lord, that you would indeed uh, uh, bring good results for them and that you would maintain their health. And Lord, we pray uh, also for Jack and the struggles that uh, he has. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, uh, surround him and Willie with your comfort and strength. Our Father in heaven, we pray uh, that you would also uh, bless us Today, as we celebrate the Reformation, and Lord, not to be uh, proud of our heritage in the sense of lording it over other people, but thankful and grateful uh, that we have that faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And our Father in heaven, we know how important that is, because to meddle with your word, to meddle with the gospel, puts other people in danger because they don't hear the gospel. And they can't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to bless your churches up and down this land and that they would be faithful to your word and that you would grant them leaders and people uh, to embrace that glorious gospel and to stand uh, for it and to contend for it, even as your word says. And, Lord, that each and every one of us may be an, uh, an agent of change by the way that we live and how we support one another and support your church. And our Father in heaven, we pray for those that uh, find themselves in difficult churches. And Lord, we pray that you would strengthen them uh, to be a agents of change there, but in a loving and a gentle way, but nevertheless, in a, in a way that doesn't compromise your word. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for those that have gone in uh, before us in the past, 
those that have sacrificed and fought and uh, secured this wonderful heritage for us. But our Father in heaven, we pray that we may take up that challenge ourselves and be reformers in the present. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would also uh, hear the prayers of your people. We all come with burdens on our hearts and uh, concerns on our minds. And Lord, we pray that we might uh, know uh, that each and every one of us had access to your throne of grace. And our Father in heaven, we pray that we may uh, know that even now as we bring our prayer, prayers before you uh, silently. And Lord, we pray that we, that may strengthen and give us peace to go forward, knowing that you care not only about the church in general, but about each and every one of your children. And so, Father, we pray that you would hear our prayers, that you would answer them according to your most perfect will. And now let's stand and sing God's praises from the blue hymnal number 467. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from uh, 2 Kings chapter 22. Uh, 
I'm going to read some verses. Um, oops. Begin to read at verse uh, 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, Jedidah the daughter of Adiah of Bozkah, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the scribe, the son of Azalea, to the, uh, the son of Meshullam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work who are the overseers in the house of the Lord. Let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord doing the work to repair the damages of the house, to carpenters and builders and masons, and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that was found in the house, and have delivered it into the hand of all those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And it happened, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes, then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahiakim the son of Shaphan, Akbor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And then chapter 23, verses 1 to 5. Now the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with, all, and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people took a stand for the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem 
and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. And then finally, verse 21 to 27. Then the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in this book of the covenant. Such a Passover surely had never been held since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the, the priest found in the house of the Lord. Now before him there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, with which his anger was aroused against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, My name shall be there. So far the reading of God's word. Dear people of God, as we celebrate the Reformation of the 16th century, um, of which we and other Reformed churches are inheritors, it is vital for us to remember that the Reformation has to be a continuous activity. It is not something we do and then leave it and everything goes fine. It's a constant calling of God's people, a constant vigilance to faithfulness to God's word, because there is always that tendency to challenge the gospel. There's always that uh, uh, tendency to modify things according to our own likes and dislikes. And we've looked at many different aspects about the Reformation uh, in this past month, but uh, certainly we want to look at this one and bring each and every one of us into the picture. Reformations don't happen because Simply individuals rise up. Without the people, there would be no reformation. Individuals can't do it in and of themselves. They can lead, but if there is no one to lead, then there is no lasting reformation. No, the script, the, the history of the Jews is certainly one that shows that there has to be a continual effort because their history is charactered um, by a pendulum that swings from uh, apostasy to reformation. Apostasy, reformation. Apostasy, reformation. It didn't just happen once. I mean, the book of the Judges that is mentioned here uh, makes that very clear. If we don't persist, if we don't keep that that spirit alive, then very quickly it goes back to the same old uh, ways in which we depart from God's truth and choose our own path. And not only the Jews, of course, but if, if you look at church history, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. A continual effort has to be made. And this is part of our Christian pilgrimage until the Lord comes. Of course, we have to be careful that we don't imagine that every church struggle is an act of reformation. 
We know that there needs to be reformation in the church and, and we're vigilant about it, but sometimes we can get so hypersensitive that every little thing becomes a mountain for us. Every little thing becomes a 16th century reformation. We go at it with all of our strength, which is absolute foolishness. Absolute foolishness. We get so, uh, uh, so uh, activated that we start minutely picking faults and making fights. That's not the Christian spirit. We are to live at peace with people. We are to be loving. We are to be gentle. It's only when the gospel is threatened, it's only when the faith is attacked, that we're to stand up. Stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we ought not to be bitter people where every little thing that doesn't, isn't the way that we think it should be and now a fight occurs. And so we upset people and we get upset. Now that is not reformation. Nothing of the sort. That's just being difficult. That's just loving fights. And Christians are not to be that way. There's plenty of times where we do have to stand up. And we do have to sacrifice. And even then, we do it lovingly and gently for the sake of God's word. Now Jude calls us to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. That is a word that comes to you, not just to leaders. Yes, leaders need to stand up, but it comes to you as individuals, as, as members of churches, that we need to stand behind leaders that contend for the faith, that stand for the word of God, because that can be a lonely task and a difficult one at that. Now we need to be ready to play, to play our part, to be agents of reformation. No reformers come in all shapes and sizes. And we must never think, well, I'm, I'm not that important. I can't make any difference. No, you can. By supporting others that God calls to stand and to lead his people. No, we need leaders, but we need laity. And this very church began, not necessarily because of leaders, because of people, people that loved God's word, people that saw that, uh, that danger in terms of the denomination, even though they didn't have leaders on the local level, nevertheless, they took a stand. And we're here to enjoy that. And we're glad in this place to have a church that seeks to be faithful to God's word, not seeks to go around fighting with every other church, but seeks to be faithful to God's word so that the gospel can continue to be preached and people can hear it and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I decided to look into the Old Testament and look at Josiah. Here's a pattern. Here are characteristics that you will see in him that ought to be characteristics that mark us. This is a way that we need to have in terms of our minds and attitudes. And so, first of all, here is a path of reform. It's a path of obedience. That's what it is. It's a path of obedience. Josiah became king, we are told, when he was eight years old, and he reigned 31 years over Judah. His grandfather Manasseh was 12 years when he came to the throne and he reigned a whopping 55 years. But the sad thing about him is that we're told that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He wasn't an instrument of change for the good he was an instrument of change for wickedness. And Ammon, the father of Josiah, 
came to the throne when he was 22 years old, and he only reigned two years. And of him it is also said, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Josiah, however, was different. Josiah was different than his father, and he was different than his grandfather, for he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He followed the Lord. In fact, he followed David rather than his father and grandfather. Family loyalties should not dictate how we live our lives. Family loyalty isn't the Bible for us. No, it's the word of God that we need to follow. And if we find ourselves in that sad situation where our father did what was right in his own eyes and his, his father, grandfather, our grandfather did that, we ought not to think that that's the way that we ought to go. That that's um, uh, showing respect to our father and grandfather. No, absolutely not. We are to show our allegiance to the Lord and those that love the Lord. And so he followed after David, who was many, many years before him. But he had an affinity with him in terms of his likeness of faith with David, to love God with all of his heart and with all of his soul. Now, people of God, our aptness for being a reform is not based on age or education or position, but rather a devotion to the Lord. So whether you're a young person or an adult or a member uh, of the church or an office bearer, what equips us to be part of any reformation of God is of our life. That it can be described as doing right, what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Which was, of course, the opposite of the book of Judges. I mean, what a terrible refrain uh, to have for a book. That which came up over and over again. And what was it? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. The book of the law, in, in, in context with what we just read in, in terms of the word of God, they had lost the law of God. They didn't follow it. They didn't need it. Because... They were their own guys. They did what was right in their own eyes. When they, needed, when they needed to make a decision about whether they were going to do something or not, it wasn't to the book of the law that they went. They just thought about it themselves. What was in their best interest? And sad to, day, sad to say, churches have done that down church history, and they're still doing it, as we can see all around us doing what they think is right in their own eyes. And more often than not, more often than not, is doing what they think the, the general public wants. So not even what is right in their own eyes, it's what the customer wants. And therefore they change in ways that they're no longer recognizable as churches that believe and trust the word of God. Now, people of God, if you're going to be an instrument of reformation for the good, then you have to be someone that does what is right in the sight of the Lord. That ought to be your first question. What does God say? What does the Lord say? What does his word say? That ought to be our guide. Not our families. You know, in the, in, the, in the struggles that we had in terms of uh, 25 years ago now, um, there, there was a real painful and challenging time because not all the families thought the same. I mean, it, within one family, not everyone thought the same. And so when there was a struggle in the church and the time came that they were going to uh, split, Families were split. And whether they were young people or whether they were the seniors, 
the, the refrain was that their faith was more important than family. And so many, two-thirds of the seniors came, left the church. In other words, they uh, left and formed a, a new church. And many of the young people left. Their parents didn't leave. But they left. Because they stood behind their faithful leaders and they knew that they were seeking to be faithful to God's word. And so they left with them. That's what I'm saying. Each and every one has to be an instrument of, of change. And what a blessing that was to have those people. And what a, an encouragement they were to others. Not that they hated their families. They didn't. They loved their families. But their families weren't very nice to them because they were leaving the old church and caused difficulties for them. But nevertheless, they didn't say, well, the, the cost is too much. No, they stood firm. And it took a whole lot of effort to do that. But it's also a path of faithfulness. Who are your heroes? Your role models for the Christian life? As I said, we're told that Josiah walked in all the ways of his father David. That was a hero. That's what he looked, looked to. To those that were faithful in the past. As I said, between these two kings, there was, there was a gap of 400 years. But they were on the same narrow path of obedience. There was an affinity between them. Perhaps some criticized Josiah for all the changes that he made, arguing that he was insulting his father and grandfather, who after all had been reigning for the last 57 years, overturning their practices in such a radical way. Paul, no doubt, was criticized for deviating from the long line of Jewish leaders and high priests that opposed the Lord. Luther, no doubt, was chided for deviating from the long list of church theologians and thinking that he was the only one that was right. And as I say, this continues to, the, to be the argument of those that want the status quo as far as heresy is concerned. No, we face intimidation from all kinds of quarters. But we have to take our cue from those that have been faithful to the Lord. And history has shown the benefits of their faithfulness. Whether such models are current or in the distant past, they must serve to encourage us. This is why we must be familiar with the faithful. This is why we rejoice and celebrate reformers of the past like Josiah and Luther. We want them to be our patterns for life and especially in terms of reform in the church. We all need role models. Let us choose the faithful servants of God so that we might remain faithful to the Lord. But it's also a path of perseverance. Josiah was fully committed to the path of obedience and the path of the faithful. It was a path that did not have U-turns, God is not one who changes his truth midstream. I can't ever forget a conversation that I read about. An Anglican leader said in regards to the issue of women in office to a Catholic priest. He says, perhaps God is leading us in a new direction. I mean, that was his statement. Perhaps God is leading us in a new direction. Well, God must be leading them in new directions every year because every year they change. It gets worse and worse. And he was answered by the Roman Catholic leader that God does not lead us contrary to the Bible. <laughs> what an amazing answer. If only the Catholic Church would listen to him. But at least he taught the Anglican churches 
that they were going off on a wrong track. And to have that idea that God is leading is a new way, then how do we know that that's a new way? How do we know that's God's word? Where are we going to go and check that, that um, uh, path that they have taken that it is according to God? We can't go to the Bible because in their own words, God leading in a new way. Well, how do we know it's God and not the devil himself? There is no way of checking. How do we know when the Pope says something ex cathedra that it is God's, God's word? I mean, we can go to the Bible and check it because if it was in the Bible, he doesn't have to say it. It's already in the Bible. But when it's not in the Bible and he says it, adds to it, how are we ever going to check? We can check. Now God's word, like Christ's atonement, is once and for all. We don't need additions anymore. No, we stick to God's word. How many times have we heard the arguments that things are different now? I mean, that's the way the world around us speaks. And that's why uh, the way the churches that want to pander to the, to the population around them speak. Well, the, we don't, we, I mean, that was years ago. Now it's a, it's a modern world. As though God's word doesn't fit anymore. It's not adequate anymore to lead people in righteousness. Now Joshua was told clearly by God that he was not to turn to the right or to the left, but he was to follow the law of God. And that continues to apply to each and every one of us. But what were the measures of reform that Josiah instituted? Well, first of all, it was the house of God. He gave importance to the house of God. And so he, he began work, or got work done, uh, in terms of restoring God's house. And when you look at what, God's house, what the state the, God's house was in, it's a shameful thing. When you hear the things that they took out, idolatrous things, how did they ever get in there in the first place? Here was the house of God. Here's where God put his name. Here's where they came to meet with God and to worship him and adore him. How did the idols ever get in there? Didn't anyone stand up? Didn't the people stand up? Was it such a complicated theological uh, thing that they did that the people couldn't figure it out? They said, well, I don't know whether it's right or wrong. I, I, I don't know. It's different. But, you know, maybe the high priests have thought all about that and it's okay. I mean, a child should have been able to tell them that it was wrong. And so he gave effort to the house of God. You think it didn't get any pushback? You think it was easy for the king to make these drastic changes? People of God, churches start fighting when you get a piano. Some people like it, some people don't. Or you change the color of the carpet. People get up and, and get all kinds of uh, um, challenges come up. Any little thing that changes, people get upset. He was taking major changes in the, house, in the house of God. And he had to stand up for it. Did what was right in the eyes of God. No one could deny that God's law taught very well how, the God, how God's house was to be kept. But of course, how would they know? I mean, how would people know? I mean, I'm sure they should have known just from, you know... Uh, uh, visiting it and being in God's house and their fathers and forefathers. But for 57 years, these people did what was right in their own eyes. And the book of the law they didn't have. What were they doing for all of those years when it came to reading? Did they read the law of God? How could they? They didn't have it. It was lost. In the house of God, by the way. In the house of God. And no one said a word. The priest didn't say, you know, 
we're going to have a search party. Everyone turn up because we're going to search uh, uh, up and down uh, the temple and find it because we can't do it without the law of God. We need the law of God. No, I, we're not told of anything, any measures like that. It's okay. We can continue even though we don't have it. How many churches are there currently in this country and other countries where they won't read the Word of God because it will condemn the things that they stand for? I mean, after all, some, kind, some of our nations are looking at some of the things that the Scriptures teach and they, and they uh, label it hate speech. No wonder those churches don't want to read the Word of God and certainly not those passages. No, they'd lost the word of God. And so here was this house. I mean, if it was a den of thieves in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was a useless place before Josiah. There's no point going there. What were you going to hear? You weren't going to hear the law of God. You were going to see all these idolatrous things going on. It did more damage than good. And so Josiah began that work. 18 years old. Didn't take a genius. 18 years old. He came to the throne when he was 8 years old. But he had to be taught. He had to learn. There were some faithful that were able to instruct him. And when he was 18, he began the work, restoring God's house, cleansing it, just like the Lord Jesus Christ did of the temple, cleansing it, removing things from there. And as I say in the process, the word of God came. The law. The word of God is the foundation of the church. That's the way Ephesians 2 speaks about it. The book of the law ignored there was no foundation to their faith because they didn't refer to it. They didn't read it. Obviously not. The Word of God becomes non-operational. We can do without it. Well, of course we can. If we're going to do what is right in our own eyes, why do we need the law of God? We just refer to ourselves, to common consensus, what makes it easy for us? What is comfortable for us? No, but that isn't the Word of God. How did the Word of God function in the Roman Catholic Church? Well, the people don't have to read the Word of God. They can't read the Word of God. They can't understand the Word of God. They're way too simple. We have to tell them. And so they weren't reading the Word of God. And to publish the Word of God and give it into the hands of people was like insulting the Word of God. I mean, they must have had a fit if they were in our day. Bibles all over the place. But not then. But the people were superstitious. All kinds of things were brought. The people couldn't tell any difference. So... If I buy indulgence, that's fine. My, my sins are taken care of. Yep. And about my loved one, can I buy indulgence for them too? Yep. It didn't dawn on people that this was sheer madness, that it didn't make sense at all, and on the leaders building this wonderful St. Peter's Basilica on the backs of people and that with lies? Why didn't they know? Well, what were they going to do? Go home and read the Bible? No. Were the priests teaching them? No. They were doing all of these things in, in Latin that the people didn't even know what they were saying. Just rites and ceremonies. What ignorance. What a weakened state it was. But the Bible was found. The law of God was found. And when Josiah heard the law read to him, 
you saw his response. He humbled himself. He tore his clothes. He couldn't believe that this is, this is uh, what was allowed to happen. He tore his clothes. And he immediately went to work. Go and inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written in it. That, that's taking the word of God seriously. That's hearing the word of God and giving reverence to it and humbling, uh, humbling uh, oneself before it and recognizing who this great God is. And how foolish we are to cast it aside and do what is right in our own eyes. That there is no fear of God. That's the way Romans 3 speaks about uh, uh, um, wicked natures. There's no fear of God in their eyes. But that is certainly addressed in Josiah. The king. He had all this power. But he humbled himself before God when he read the law. He knew that they were guilty. And that they deserve the wrath of God for what they had done. And so what does he do? He leads the people to renew their covenant with God. In chapter 23. He went to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah and with him, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, And the law was read before them all. They had to hear it themselves. It wasn't just for the leaders to hear the law. They had to hear the law. And by the law, I don't necessarily mean just the Ten Commandments, but the books of Moses. All about God and how wonderful he was and and the covenant that he had entered into his people. But they trashed the covenant. They gave no importance to it at all. And so now he leads them back. Back to humbling themselves together before God. To be obedient to him. To hear his word. To obey his word. Not to go off on a tangent. Not to do what was right in their own eyes. Not to please those people around them. But to honor him in every aspect of our life. And to lead them to worship God. God. There was no worship before. I mean, it's like Isaiah 1. Oh yes, you go ahead and do all these rites and ceremonies, but, but it's a misnomer to call it worship. It's not the worship of, the, of Jehovah God. God doesn't hear it. He says, I close my ears. I put my hands over my ears. I don't listen to what you're saying. I don't honor what you're saying because it's absolute garbage. That's what it is. Because your hearts are not in it and you're not obeying me at all. You're just engaging in some sort of religious activity, which these people were too. With all these idols, that's worship. You're bowing down before them. And you're supposed to be honoring me. That's not worship. As God says in Isaiah 1, it makes me sick. It literally turns my stomach. And it's so obvious, but you don't see it. And so Josiah leads them to worship, to humble themselves before God, to honor him, to follow, as it were, the regulative principle that we only worship God in the ways that he has commanded us to do so in his word. And so they celebrated the Passover, and it was never celebrated, even from the times of the judges. That's how long it had been. Worship corrupted. And now Josiah, as I said, at the age of 18, at the age of 18, leads people to be faithful, to give themselves wholeheartedly with all of their heart and all of their mind and with all of their soul to think about what they're doing. Think about what God is saying. And to embrace him with grateful hearts. And then finally, what are the results 
of reform. Well, first of all, the remnant is renewed. Godly reformations are a blessing for God's people. What blessings have been enjoyed by God's people since the days of the Reformation? What blessings we've enjoyed. This wonderful Reformation that brought out before us the glorious aspects of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer being uh, bondage to superstitious rites, but to be free, to know what it is to be called the children of God and have the right to be called the children of God and not to have to pay premiums week by week by week to be assured of our sins being forgiven, not to be scared about our loved ones and be uh, forced to pay money to have them released. I mean, death is hard enough itself to see loved ones pass from this life is hard enough. And for the church to use that and say they're in purgatory and they're suffering and it's your money that can set them free. I mean, what an abuse of religion that is. And what an abuse of the people. That's the state they were in. But oh, what wonderful delights fill the heart of God's people when they once again hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Not I will give you indulgences. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. I'll give you an anchor for the soul. In all the ups and downs and struggles of life, you will have peace that fills your heart and your mind. That's the gospel that we need to preach to people. Not to hold them in bondage. The people of God need to be free. They need to enjoy the blessings that God has secured for them through the Lord Jesus Christ. They were in bondage once to the devil. They don't need to be in bondage to anyone else. They need to enjoy that right to be called children of God. They need to enjoy that access they have to God's throne of grace. Don't restrict it. Don't deny it to them. Encourage them to taste and see that the Lord is good and unbelief is punished. Lest we think that corruption and deviation from God's word is nothing to fear, since God will clean up after us through reformations. We read that Josiah's reformation did not turn the Lord's fierce wrath and anger from Judah. Yes, there was a reformation. But yes, there was an accounting. To those that stuck to their unbelief, God is not mocked. God doesn't allow himself to be provoked by people and there's no response from God. Absolutely not. There is a righteous anger. Not an anger that is out of control. Not an anger that doesn't see the remnant. Not an anger that doesn't bless his people as they humble themselves before him. But on the other hand, God's justice doesn't get turned aside. It was not more than 60 years before God's wrath was revealed as Jerusalem was destroyed and Judah was carried away into exile. To be sure, God preserved his remnant and his remnant survived the just shall live by faith, and they did through those difficult times. But in the same events, God also punishes those that attack him and attack his people and attack his word. And so, as I said, Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been taken into exile, but they apparently didn't learn from that. And now they had this reformation in Josiah. Obviously it didn't continue. 
because 60 years later, they were back at it and they were taken into exile. One can only wonder what God has in store for churches that profane the church of God as they blatantly reject God's word. That's what we see all around us. And the, and the society can see it too. I mean, not everyone in society is for all the changes uh, that we see in our society and churches that are following them. They, can, they can't make head or tails of it too. I remember a shocking conversation I had with one of our relatives to do with the churches in Canada and all the progressive things that, were, uh, that they were doing. And he said to me, he was a lawyer, and he said to me, what's happening to the church? Even I can see that that's wrong. And yet the church was embracing it. And that's what we have in our day and age. Churches pronouncing terrible things and encouraging people in terrible things and saying everything is okay, this is fine, God is happy, you can be members, you can be ministers, you can do whatever. God is not mocked. God will chastise. And those that seek to damage his word and to replace it, there is a price to pay. It's called the justice of God. We're the ones that have a role to play to avert that. That they might repent that they may return to God's word. Because if they don't, then God will bring upon them his retribution. And we pray that they would be saved before that, that they would turn from their wicked ways. Because our God is a gracious God. But he will not be mocked. And whether they're churches that follow that crowd or not, they will all face the retribution of God. And so people of God, we need more reformers. We need more agents of change. We need more people to stand up in a loving way and draw people back to God's word, to loving him and to serving him, just as many have done in the past, who should be our heroes of faith. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, it is indeed a vexation of our souls to live in this country that is claimed to be the best country in the world. And yet, our Father, we are vexed every day as we see what goes on all around us, as we see what is lifted up and praised and defended not only in the society, which is sad enough, but then they have many churches that stand right behind them and cheer them on. Now, Father in heaven, we are certainly in need of a reformation. And now we pray for churches, small and large, whatever denomination they may be in, Lord, that they may turn back to you back to your word, back to the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, we pray for our own church and our own churches, that we would not sit back and think that these things can never happen to us, but rather, our Father, that we, that we would be vigilant week by week and year by year to stand against the trends that are all around us that we might be faithful to you and that we might indeed be houses, your houses, where people can come and hear the gospel and receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Our Father, strengthen us as your people. Make us people of the book, your book. For we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now stand and respond as we sing from the Blue Hymnals once again, number 444. Hey, hey, hey. 
seek to work us woe, His craft and power great, and armed with cruel hate, on earth is not His equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving? Ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is He, Lord Sabbath, His name, from age to age the same, and He must win the battle. And though this world with Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, thy great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh